A must-win game for Mikel Arteta's Gunners. Odegaard to start, or is it too soon? Rice struggling with a broken toe, and the boss isn't giving up on the Premier League title just yet. This is the Chronicles of Aguna podcast with me, Harry Simeon. And on this edition of the show, we're previewing that big clash on Sunday down at Stamford Bridge. Hey everybody, how are you? Welcome back to another episode of the Chronicles of Aguna podcast with me, your host, Harry Simi. You hope you're all well. Uh, apologies for the lack of a show yesterday. I was on my way back from Milan, uh, got back to London Stansted Airport at around about half past 10 in the morning. By the time I got the train back home, I had to get ready and go to work. Um, and uh, yeah, get down to Talk Sport 2, where myself and Kwaku Afari had a good old chinwag about this game. He is, of course, a Chelsea fan, a very, very good friend, brilliant, super talented broadcaster. We had some real in-depth conversations around this game, and I think a lot of what was spoken about in those co conversations is probably going to come through on today's podcast, because I started to look at this game in a slightly different way to the way I'd viewed it in the build-up. And I think that's interesting. I think it's always interesting when you speak to someone who's far more across the club that you're coming up against than yourself. Some of your maybe preconceptions around that team, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, they can be corrected, shall we say. And I'm really, really looking forward to getting into today's show because um, I think this is a fascinating game. I really, really do. I want to start off with the kind of elephant in the room. Is this must win? And the truth is, guys... It is. I can't see how anybody could package this game up in any other way. And even the most positive of Arsenal supporters, and I'm someone who's often labelled as toxic positive, which is a, a new phrase that entered my vocabulary maybe six months ago, eight months ago, nine months ago. I don't know. Anyway, apparently I'm toxic positive and that's cool. Label me whatever you want. But even I believe that this is a must-win game because you look at the Premier League table at the minute, guys, and it just seems obvious. It just seems obvious that we can't afford to lose any more ground. Mikel Arteta has been very buoyant in his press conference and you wonder how much of that is Mikel just trying to kind of create a spark within the changing room. He's, I think, overplayed how good the performance was against Inter. I thought it was okay. I thought it was decent. I said in the reaction pod to that game that we deserved the point but to say that we deserved more is probably going a little bit overboard I understand why Mikel would want the players to feel that the performance was of that level and people will say well no the standards should always be high and maintained and all the rest of it and I get that and I agree with that but I think for Mikel Arteta he's in this situation and in this space right now where he desperately needs to get these guys going and he can see that the confidence isn't where it has been in the past and isn't where it needs to be for Arsenal to perform to their maximum level. So I feel like there's a bit of that from him. And so I don't read into those comments too much. Like I know some fans have taken what he said in the aftermath of the Inter game and in the build-up to the Chelsea game relating back to that European tie and gone, what's the matter with this guy? He's deluded. He thinks we were great. We weren't great. I don't think Mikel Arteta thinks we were great. I think Mikel Arteta thinks the performance was an improvement on the ones he'd seen in recent weeks. And he's trying to use that in a positive way. And he's trying to essentially stick a rocket um, up the backsides. Obviously, proverbially, right? Um, <laughs> uh, you know, of, the, of this team to get them going again, to get them firing again. But this game is absolutely must win. And under normal circumstances, a trip to a good Chelsea side, because they are a good Chelsea side under Enzo Maresca, they've improved a lot this season. A trip there is a game that I would look at and I'd say, yep, yeah, a point is OK. I know if you want to win titles, you've got to go and win these games. And I remember last season, it was kind of a weird one because we'd gone there. We were expected to beat them. We went 2-0 down. And we found the way back into the game and we ended up leaving with a 2-2 draw and a point. And that point felt like a good point because of the circumstances. But anything less than all three this weekend, I think, is going to feel like, like a bit of a disappointment, like trouble. There's some really interesting fixtures going on today in the Premier League as well. I'm not saying 
I am not saying that we are going to see both Manchester City and Liverpool drop points today. But when you look at the games that they've got coming up, Liverpool take on an out of form, it has to be said, Aston Villa side, but a side that are capable of producing a result. There's no doubt about that. Aston Villa have been brilliant under Unai Emery. And although Liverpool are in form and are the heavy favourites here, you wouldn't put it past Villa getting something at Anfield. You look at Manchester City's game, they travel down to the south coast where they'll take on Brighton and Hove Albion. Again, I'm not saying that these teams are going to drop points, but there's a chance they will. And if they do and Arsenal don't capitalise on that, then you worry, don't you? Because another week will have passed without us being able to reduce the arrears and the deficit. I know there'll be weeks where we have much easier games on paper. And when you think about the games that we've played, and Mikel Arteta made this point, we've been to City, we've been to Villa, we've been to Spurs, um, we'd have been to Chelsea after this, we've been to Newcastle. When you think about all of that, it is, as I've said for the last few weeks, understandable that we're a little bit off the pace. Factor in all the injury problems and all the rest of it as well. You, I'm not saying it's acceptable or it's good enough, but you can see the reasons why, right? You don't need to conduct this really deep analysis to understand why Arsenal are where they are. It's as simple as terrible fixtures and key players being missing at key moments. Now, are there other things as well? Yes, like the attack is clearly not firing in the way we'd like it at the moment, even with what you would deem to be our first choice attack available. We hope that Martin Odegaard is going to play a significant part in this game on Sunday. But you see where I'm going with this, right? There's an explanation at the very least. And I take some comfort in that because I think the most worrying times that you will go through as a football fan is when you look at that team and you think, actually, that's a really good team. And there aren't really any standout reasons or excuses as to why they're not producing, but they just aren't. And there's been a couple of occasions, like the Bournemouth performance I thought was really poor, but then again, we were without Saka and Odegaard. The Newcastle performance was the one that really got me um, in terms of frustration. I was really disappointed by that because I thought with the team that we had on the pitch, we we ought to have offered a hell of a lot more and it just didn't happen. So big disappointment there. But Arsenal, for me, have to go to the bridge and win. And if they don't, I'm not sure that I'm going to change my view from last week around the title race, which was simply Arsenal are out of it until they string a run together that shows me they're back in it. They have to earn the right to be back in it because right now they're not there. Now, Mikel has been speaking ahead of this one uh, in his press conference, as I mentioned, and he's talked team news. Obviously, we learned over the past few days that Declan Rice, who missed the inter-trip, is currently struggling with a broken toe. Will he be able to play against Chelsea at the weekend? Mikel Arteta refused to rule him out, but he said he had to be vague around this one because the truth is he just doesn't know if the £105 million midfield star is going to make it. This depends on a lot of things. This depends on whether you think that pain management is the right way to go to get him through such an important game. Obviously, he's got the international break to come uh, after this one. Uh, the other thing is that, of course, it depends which toe it is. Um, and I know that sounds ridiculous, but it, it does matter. Like if it's your big toe, it's a big problem. Um, if it's your little toe and you wrap it up, maybe you get by. If it's one of the inside toes, is that what they're even called? I don't know. Um, maybe you get away with it. So it depends on that. We don't really have any more information on there. So Declan Rice, it seems, is, is touch and go. I just wonder if Mikel left him out midweek knowing that he was going to need him at the weekend and, and trying to push him to be ready and available for this one, which, as I keep saying, is a must-win game. And I'm sure, despite what Mikel Arteta says publicly, he knows that deep down. There's concern over Kai Havertz, who had to go off against Inter with a pretty bad cut to the head. Will he be available to play against his former club? I bloody hope so, because in terms of centre-forward options, he is head and shoulders, not just in terms of his height, above everybody else that we've got available to us. And then there's the question, of course, of Martin Odegaard. Now, he was back in the squad for the trip to Inter. He came off the bench for a very, very short period of time um, as a result of Kai Havertz having to go off. Perhaps he wouldn't have come on at all had Kai Havertz not suffered the injury that he did because Mikel left it really, really late. It wasn't, you know, 20 minutes to go, a goal down, let's throw him on. That that wasn't the approach. And there were others that came on ahead of him, which suggests to me that they're trying to be quite careful with Martin Odegaard. Uh, he's been out for a long time and he's a really, really important player. 
And then you think about sort of the way we've adjusted the team in recent weeks to cope with the Norwegians' absence, to cope with that lack of creativity. And we've sort of reverted into a slightly different shape. We've gone back to that kind of 4-4-2 thing that served us quite well at times last season. Hasn't really worked the same this season. And for me, there's a couple of players that need to come out of the starting eleven um, based on what we've seen in recent weeks. Two players that started in Milan that I would leave out. And I'll come on to reveal who they are uh, when I come on to uh, share with you guys uh, my team selection for this one. But yeah, I mean, I'm nervous because I know that Chelsea are a very, very good side under Enzo Maresca. They've been really, really impressive. I think that in the summer, there was so much talk, wasn't there, about uh, the volume of players that Enzo Maresca was having to deal with. How was he going to cope with that? How was he going to keep that equilibrium, if you like, within the squad? How was he going to ensure that everybody was happy, that everybody was singing from the same hymn sheet? Would he face and run into a lot of the same problems that, um, that, that Maurizio Pochettino did before him? And you look at the league table now. Chelsea are on the same points as us. So if you think that we're in the title race at this moment in time, then you have to put Chelsea in there as well. I know they've had much more difficult fixtures and I know that you could argue that over the, the long course of the season that is still to run, they're expected to drop off a little bit because they're still a largely young side, a largely inexperienced side. And if you go back through Enzo Maresca's coaching history, there does tend to be a little bit of a drop-off in the second part of seasons. And we saw that with his Leicester City team last season. There was a point where they were running away with the league, um, the, with the championship, that is. And there was also a point where people worried that they were going to self-destruct and that they were going to actually blow it and end up having to go through the playoffs, which would have been a major disappointment given the lead that they had um, in their hands. So... I don't think Chelsea will be in the title race come the final months of the season, but you have to give them immense praise for where they are right now. Cole Palmer is obviously a player that we need to be careful of. Um, you know, I've seen him be accused recently of being a bit of a flat track bully. I've seen some posts on social media where it's said that he doesn't turn up against the biggest teams. I just think the biggest and best teams will make, or, or will have the ability, I should say, to limit him or limit the supply to him and obviously he's playing in a more central area now whereas last season he played a lot from the right hand side they've got pace in those wide areas whether it be Madweke or Neto um, you know they've got those options it's a pretty deep squad it might be a young squad it might be a very expensively assembled squad it might be um, an inexperienced squad as well but it's a squad that has a really good size to it and I think Chelsea will probably feel like they're in a position now when it comes to injuries where they can actually rotate and use that squad in the way that it was built to be used, essentially. So what can we expect from them? I think a really front-footed approach. I think they're going to want to take the game to us. It's the Enzo Maresca way. They're going to want to have possession. They're going to try and play out from the back. What I thought was really, really interesting to come away from the, the Champions League game um, in midweek is that despite you know us not really creating a great deal in the game uh, on Wednesday night. And despite us not creating a great deal against PSG, you know, we we, we went 2-0 up before half time, and that was kind of that. We saw the game out. You could argue the same thing against Shakhtar. Once we scored, it was just kind of a little bit pedestrian and it was a little bit of a maybe energy-preserving performance because of the game that we had coming up uh, just a few days later. But I think when you look at that, when you think about that, you would think that the attack is misfunctioning in all departments. And the truth is it's not. It's misfunctioning in terms of chance creation and in terms of goals scored, obviously, which is predominantly what an attack is meant to do in a game of football. But in terms of what the attack offer us defensively, i.e. their ability to press, win the ball back up high uh, up the pitch, they've done really well. And I think of the top five uh, most intense pressing performances in the Champions League, like three of them were Arsenal players this season. So that goes to show that even when the goals aren't going in, a lot of these players are still putting a shift in. And I think that press is going to be really, really important and could be key against the side who insist on playing out from the back because it's the Enzo Maresca way. But in my opinion, have a goalkeeper that isn't that bloody good at it. 
So I would be all over it. Um, I would be desperately trying to uh, make the most of that. And, you know, there's a part of me that, that would leave this player out anyway. In fact, I would definitely leave this player out anyway because I think he's in a real difficult period in terms of his form. And I'll reveal who that player is in a bit. But there's a temptation, and I'm not saying I'd definitely start him, but there's a temptation given what I've just said and how sharp this other individual, Gabriel Jesus, looked when he came off the bench at Inter in comparison to how he's looked this season so far. There would be a temptation on my part to play him because I think he can lead the press in the way that he did when he first arrived at the football club. And if you can get Martin Odegaard in the side as well, and the two of them can start doing that, that was one of the real key features of this Arsenal team when they rose to prominence, um, you know, a couple of seasons ago. So, yeah, um, I think it's going to be a fascinating game. I think we're probably going to concede. People keep telling me that we've got this unbelievable defence and it was an unbelievable defence and it still is in terms of the individual talent. I would argue that we have our best back four available right now in White. Saliba, Gabriel and Timber, certainly from a defensive standpoint, you could argue that Calafiori offers a little bit more when he goes forward. Um, but I just think defensively, like if I was to trust in a back four to go away from home and get a result, it would be these guys, right? But we haven't kept a clean sheet for a while in the Premier League. And that is something that we need to fix. It's going to be difficult to do it at Stamford Bridge because of the attacking talent, as I've mentioned, that they have, I think, I've mentioned Cole Palmer, I've mentioned Madweke, Neto, just to name a few. Uh, Nicholas Jackson seems to have um, really settled in now and seems to be producing uh, some really, really good moments for Chelsea. He's a chaotic player, the kind of player that defenders hate to defend against because you just don't know what he's going to do next. That unpredictability, I think, is one of his greatest strengths. And I think he's so unpredictable that even he doesn't know what he's going to do sometimes when he receives the ball, which can work against you but can also work in your favour if it catches the defenders out. But yeah, um, I I am trying to be optimistic about this one because I think we need to be. I think that that is the mood that we need to go into this game with. Like, yeah, we're on a bit of a bad run. And yeah, we're not playing at the level that we all know that Arsenal can. But this idea that Arsenal have just become rubbish all of a sudden and have just completely... Uh, dropped off in terms of who they are as a football team. You know, I think that's people getting carried away. I I think we need to come out of this bad run really quickly if we're going to maintain a chance of winning the Premier League, of course. But why wouldn't we believe that we can do it? We had a bad run last season that we managed to come out the other side of and then we went on our best run for the last however many years. So this side have shown us before that mentally they are resilient enough to come back from difficult periods, difficult patches and difficult moments. And I think we owe it to this team because of what we've seen over the last couple of years to stick with them in the difficult moments because it's not like it was before. It's not Arsenal going through a bad run and you can't possibly see the light at the end of the tunnel. I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I think that comes down to the point I was making right at the beginning of the show with regards to seeing the reasons and understanding the reasons and feeling that although you know you can't just wave a magic wand and, and fix those things you can't wave a magic wand and rearrange your fixtures in a more favorable way you can't wave your magic wand and make Odegaard fit you can't wave your magic wand and get Gabriel Martinelli back to his best level you can't wave a magic wand and bring Leandro Trossard back to the level that he's shown in the past just for example right so believe in these guys Let's see what happens because one of the things that I really massively fear about this game is anything other than than a win, it does damage to us in terms of our title chances. I, I believe that regardless of what Man City and Liverpool do because when I look at their fixtures, I think they are potential banana skin fixtures that you probably need to come out on top in a weekend like that if you're going to claw back if you're leading I don't think it's that bad and if you're closer it's probably not that significant but in our situation I think it's really important that if they win we win and if they drop points we win so that we've taken advantage of that basically bottom line we bloody need to win this game and nothing else will do is what I'm saying here um, but yeah I think this is going to be fascinating but the, the fear just going back to that that I have is the fact that we go into an international break after this. Because we all know what happens in international breaks. People overthink. 
people over, analyze, and you can end up in a situation where the mood around the fan base can be very, very... Um, I don't want to use the term toxic because I don't think we're at that point yet, but it can be very, very downbeat. And I do think that translates across. I do think when the mood around the club in general is positive, the team will perform better. I think the players feel it when you go into the stadium with that anxiety and that kind of uh, frustration. I think it does spill over onto the pitch. And I think it's a really difficult job for coaches, for managers, for staff, for players to block that out when they're online and seeing it constantly. So... I think it's imperative that we win um, anyway, but the fact that we've got the international break and lots of time for people to stew over a potentially difficult result is is far from ideal. Anyway, let me share with you guys uh, the team that I would uh, pick for this one. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go through... The, shall I go through the statistics ahead of this game? I know some people um, like that section, so let me just uh, very, very, very quickly... Uh, run you through those I haven't prepared them to bring them up on the screen so apologies uh, for that but let me um, let me just run you through some of the stats going into this game in the head-to-head -head between these two sides um, it's Arsenal who lead the way we were really dominant over Chelsea when I was growing up but obviously in recent years that has changed not the last two three but going back to sort of the Mourinho Wenger days it, it, it's a record that I think, took a massive hit from an Arsenal perspective as a result of a really bad period. We played, we've played, we played 64 times with Chelsea in Premier League history. We've won 26 of those games. Um, there have been 20 Chelsea wins and there was 18 draws along the way. If you go back to uh, our recent results with them, looking back at the last three, Arsenal, of course, got that 2-2 draw at Stamford Bridge last season, which I mentioned, but we battered them in April uh, at the Emirates Stadium by five goals to nil. That was one of our best performances of the season. I really enjoyed that night. thought we were irresistible. That was Arsenal at their brilliant best. And if you go back to Tuesday, the 2nd of May, so towards the back end of last season, we beat them at the Emirates by three goals to one. In terms of the form guide, Chelsea have won two of their last five. They've picked up draws uh, away at Manchester United at home to Nottingham Forest, which seemed like a bad result at the time, but doesn't look that way now, considering they're above both of us. Uh, in the Premier League. Those two victories came at home to Newcastle and at home to Brighton. Arsenal have also only won two of their last five. Uh, they're without a win in three. We beat Leicester at home, Southampton at home, before losing at Bournemouth, drawing against Liverpool at Emirates Stadium and then losing up at St. James's Park, of course. Not much separates the two teams, really, in terms of the Premier League table. We're on the same points. It's fourth versus fifth in the league. We've both won five drawn three and lost two. Chelsea are scoring on average over two goals per match, which is better than us, uh, but we are conceding slightly less. We're averaging 1.1 um, goals uh, per game in terms of what we concede in there, averaging 1.2. So those are some of the statistics to give you a little bit of context uh, around this game. Right, let's go over to the tactics board and I'm going to share with you guys the team that I would pick to take on Chelsea this weekend. And of course, there's a few caveats to this, right, because we know that there are going to be decisions made late on whether Odegaard is fit to start, whether Declan Rice is available, whether Kai Havertz is available. These are three massive players for us. I'd like to think that because we're going into an international break, Mikel Arteta is going to push those guys to try and get them available, to try and get them in this game, to try and get them involved. Um, the back four picks itself. Uh, White, Saliba, Gabriel and Timber is my back four for this game. Obviously, David Raya continues in goal. I've put a couple of na other names on my team sheet already. Thomas Partey, who's been in inspired form of late. I think he's been outstanding recently. Um, and I love seeing him in that midfield. And I think that's where he needs to play, especially with Ben White back at right back. So Partey goes into my midfield. My two wingers would be Saka and Martinelli. I know that... People have been quite critical of Gabriel Martinelli recently and there's a lot of, uh, of people that feel that his level's dropped off. I agree with that to a point, but I still think he's an outlet. I still think he's an incredibly hard worker. And what's the alternative? Leandro Trossard? I think he's been really poor recently, Leandro Trossard. And you won't be surprised to hear that he, he's not going to be in my starting eleven. Now, assuming Declan Rice makes it, I would go with Rice in that midfield uh, position. I think that's really important. If he's not, though, I know a lot of people would go with Mikel Marino. Mikel Arteta would probably go with Mikel Marino, but I wouldn't. I'd go with Jorginho. If Declan Rice can't play, then I'm going with that trusted midfield 
of right uh, uh, of Jorginho and Thomas Partey. Does that mean we have to be a little bit more um, defensive in our shape? Does that mean that we have to play with sort of the double pivot rather than playing with the two eights? Um, mm, kind of, because I think that Jorginho is suited to playing in a more deeper role. But I do trust Partey to sit on his own. I don't really trust Jorginho to do that. So the only so if people are saying that Jorginho would sit deeper and Partey would push on a little bit, I don't like that. Um, for me, it's either Rice as the six, uh, sorry, Partey as the six if Jorginho plays and Jorginho sitting alongside him, obviously with a bit more license to get forward, but I'd like to see that double pivot in midfield. I think that's what we should do because I think we've got more of those players than we do have players that are suited to playing in the eight role and in those more creative roles. If you look at Mikel Marino, he was brought in as a left eight, fine. But I don't think he's at a good enough level right now to be starting a game like this. That's just my opinion. People would disagree with that. I don't think he's been particularly inspiring at the start of his Arsenal career. I'm not writing the guy off, but I would rather see, in the absence of Declan Rice, Jorginho play instead. And I don't think that's a particularly controversial opinion to hold. If Rice is available, then he plays alongside Partey, no doubt about it. If Odegaard is available, absolutely, I want to see him in the starting eleven. But if he's not, I want to see Ethan Waneri. I do. Like, I really, really do. I think this kid has got so much talent. There's so much to love about this guy. Um, he came on against Inter, and again, he looked sharp, and again, he looked like he could make things happen. He came on against Newcastle and didn't look very good, and I know a lot of people sort of were, were using that as a kind of justification for Mikel Arteta's decision, essentially, to really give him limited minutes, even in the absence of Martin Odegaard. But I just thought the whole team was dreadful that day, and I don't think you can pin that on the 17-year-old. If you're old enough, you're good enough as far as I'm concerned. And there's such a lack of creativity at the moment, particularly in the absence of Martin Odegaard. And how long has Odegaard got in the tank, by the way, as well? He's been out for two months, maybe more. So regardless of whether Odegaard starts or not, I think that these two will share this position throughout the game. And I think we need to have at least one of them on the pitch at all times because we need that bit of creativity, especially if we go with the double pivot in midfield. Jorginho, if he does play, does offer a bit more creativity from a deeper area, but I still think you need that bit of spark in the final third. That's one of the things that's been missing. If he's available, I want to see Havertz start up top. If he's not, um, because of course he suffered a head injury, then I want to see Gabi Jesus uh, take up the position. I know that he's not been great this season. I know that I've said that I'm I'm really worried about him at the minute and in terms of his level, but I just think that he looked really sharp the other night and we keep talking about Chelsea and the way they play out from the back and the way that's caused them problems at times this season. Saka, Martinelli, uh, Jesus or Havertz and Odegaard in that kind of four-man press with that security and stability that you get from having this double pivot in midfield, I think that could be massive for us. Um, and yeah, that's the way I'd like to see Arsenal line up. Now, I know there's a few caveats in my team selection um, and a few ifs and buts and maybes and all the rest of it, but that's just the nature of the beast right now, right? Because we don't know exactly who's fit and we don't know exactly who's not because Mikel Arteta is obviously, as always, very deliberately vague on these things. But yeah, uh, that's my team then. Raya in goal, White, Saliba, Gabriel and Timber across the back. Rice and Partey in midfield. If Rice is fit, if he's not, I'd bring Jorginho in to replace him. Odegaard on one area, but preferably Odegaard, obviously, but again, don't know how long he's got in the tank. And then Saka, Martinelli on the flanks. Havertz up front if he's fit enough to start. And if he's not, Gabriel Jesus would lead the line for me. My prediction for this one is... Chelsea nil, Arsenal one. I've got to be positive. I've got to be optimistic. I don't care how the victory comes. I don't care if the ball goes in off of someone's backside. As long as we get the three points that we desperately, desperately need. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section on my team selection, on my thoughts going into the game. Give us a prediction. Give us your starting 11. I'd love to hear from you guys. Thank you so, so much for joining me on another episode of the Chronicles of Aguna podcast. I will see you on the next one. Until then, take care of yourselves. Have a great day. Goodbye.